My career started in the marine industry in 1984, so it's been 40 years. Prior to that, I had gone to technical school, got an associate's degree in automotive technology. I'd worked at a couple of car dealerships. A friend of mine went and saw my wife, Sherry. I was uh, an art major in college, and I was working as a graphic designer. And I happened to be working on business cards for a local marine Dealer. said to Sherry, uh, you know, I have this marina and Louie and I are friends. I'm looking for a boat mechanic. I'd like to hire him. And I kind of chuckled and said, he doesn't know anything about boats. And the reply was, Louie's a good mechanic. I can teach him everything he needs to know. So I started in this industry in 1984 working part-time. I did that for about six months or so, and I quit the car dealership because I kind of fell in love with working on boats. That dealership had some partners. They decided that they wanted to uh, liquidate the business and get out. I was enjoying it so much uh, that I thought this might be a good opportunity for me. I had never owned my own business. I was in my early 20s. My wife's younger than I am. We were 22, 24, and too young to be afraid. We had so little that we had nothing to lose. I knew I wanted to be in business and this was a way to try it. I was certainly young enough that if I failed, I still had plenty of time to do something else. And April 1st of 1986, we incorporated Offshore Marine. The only thing we purchased was the phone number and we started from new. The first thing I did was I looked at all of the books of the previous owner to see what he was doing, what things cost, and I tried to figure out what I would need to make this work. And I went to the bank, I borrowed a little bit of money, and I rented 900 square feet of the building that the marina was in, and Sherry and I started. Um, it was she and I and one seasonal high school kid. Initially, we, we didn't turn down any type of work. It didn't matter how old it was, whether I worked on that brand or not. When we first started, uh, worked on boats all summer long, but there was no business during the winter. So for the first few years, I worked on snowmobiles. I restored cars. Uh, there was a gas station next door. I worked at the gas station. You know, I'd, I'd go to the gas station at eight in the morning and finish at four and then uh, work at the dealership, um, check the messages that not that there were any, but I did that for a first, the first few winters and, and uh, till business just kept growing. But during the summer, couldn't afford full-time people. So I had some part-time people and all of our success has just been putting the time in. It was common to start at 6.30 or 7 in the morning and work until 10, 11 o'clock at night, five, six, seven days a week. In his first years, he was doing between 75 and 80 hours a week and I was somewhere around 60 hours or so, and uh, there were many years that I had a four-month-old, a six-month-old that was working 55 hours with me. Being that my parents both started the business right around the time that I was born, I grew up here. My parents started this business a handful of years before I was born, and, and through growing up, they had to work 40, 60, 80 hours a week, and we were just a part of that. In the first years, he was working so many hours I think there would have been more a cost to us if I hadn't been part of it. Um, and because I was part of it, I totally understood the pressure that he was under in building this business. We started out with 900 square feet. We were renting half of this building and we had our service shop, our office and our showroom, which was just had marine accessories in it. And we were selling some fishing boats and some pontoon boats and 80% of our business was in a 20 mile radius. One of the things that we worked on were inboard boats that there are a lot of dealers that don't work on inboards and I'm a car guy, so it really, really spoke to me. Um, but it also taught me that because there weren't a lot of other dealers doing that type of work, that this is something that we could specialize in. And I firmly believe that if you specialize in something, it sets you apart from others. And then if you can do it better than the others, it really will, uh, will help your business grow. When we were able to purchase the building in 1992, we expanded into the other half of the building. So now that 900 square feet became all service shop. The other 900 square feet became our showroom, which again was just really accessories, couldn't put a boat in there. In 1996, um, Nautique, or back then it was called Correct Craft, it was just Correct Craft, uh, had approached me about doing warranty work on their boats and wanted me to be a dealer. 
and I just I couldn't afford to even stock one of their boats at that point. But I certainly agreed to do their warranty work, and uh, that's when they said, well, listen, why don't we put a couple of boats on your lot and consignment, and let's see where it goes. And in 1997, we were able to sign a contract as a dealer. That was a pivotal point in our dealership. Um, with Nautique being at the level it is, uh, as far as uh, their customer satisfaction and, and the quality of boats that they, they put out, it said something about our dealership. In 2003, we took, one, we took half of one of our storage buildings, took all the storage racks out of it, finished it off, and moved the service shop from the main building to a storage building. Moving the shop out of the main building into that back building was, uh, was a pretty big deal also. It, it was about triple the size of what, what our shop originally was. And we were able to take the wall down between our old service shop and the showroom. I remember Christmas break when we were shut down for vacation, going with dad and taking a sledgehammer to the wall between the, the shop and the showroom. In our first facility, I mean, there's plenty of pictures with me with a sledgehammer taking down, at the time, was our major expansion, taking down the wall between our service department and our showroom to make one big showroom. And now we actually were able to have a couple boats in our showroom. As time went on, we continued to outgrow the shop, the new shop that was was expanded and bigger to where we, we pulled the wall down and renovated the whole rest of that building. By doing that, we were able to give each technician their own bay, um, their own tools to work with, garden hoses and electric lines and air hoses and so forth, and, and we're able to streamline a lot of what we were doing. Because before it was uh, three guys working out of one door and it never failed. The guy, the guy was working in the back, he was always the one that needed to come out that door first. So it was move three or four boats out of the way to be able to get him out, put everything back in to, to keep, keep working. Probably around 2011 or 12, we purchased the property next door and were able to expand. Got that to be our, our boat lot. That allowed us to display now our new and used boats with 500 some feet of road frontage. By expanding that way and so forth, it made the dealership look so much larger. It promoted more business. We became someone that people wanted to really do business with because we were successful. I think it was 2015, we uh, took on Mastercraft. And so with Mastercraft and Nautique being direct competitors, I've been asked the question, how does that work? Having two brands in the same dealership in this area worked for us. Um, what I had found over my research and my experience over many, many years was that there are a lot of cu customers that are brand loyal. The Mastercraft brand had a huge following in this area. And so that was another, another pivotal point in our in our growth as a as a dealer it grew like a freight train ahead of us we had no choice but to expand all the way through my wife and i started to we drove around and went to motorcycle dealerships car dealerships to see what they really looked like and what we liked and we pretty much gutted the whole front of the building took the whole front off put floor to ceiling glass in really changed the appearance of the dealership upscale to match the products that we were selling. Just a couple of years ago, another pivotal point was we took on Barletta pontoons. And so by taking on Barletta as our primary pontoon boat line, um, it absolutely matched the quality of the other brands that we carried in Mastercraft and Nautique. And our business just grew again. Around that time, our boys came into the business. My boys were part of this business. Um all the way through through grammar school through high school through college they worked for the dealership started off running the tractors really really young started moving moving trailers around the yard freshman year of high school was probably the first year that i had a lot of time almost like a full-time job throughout the summer um had some big projects some more responsibilities here at the dealership grew up in and around the business um and as I then got my driver's license as a way to pay for my truck, put gas in my tank. In the summers, after school, during high school, I would come to the dealership and, and work after school every day and Saturdays and then through the summers as well. By the time they got to middle school and then, or their early years of high school, when we were asking, hey, do you ever think you want to be part of this business? The answer was no. At the point that I went through my senior year of high school, I really had like most teenagers, I'm sure, had no idea what direction I wanted to go with my life. Not ever really imagining that 
the dealership was where I saw a future, where I, an aspiration of mine to be a part of. When I graduated high school, uh, I wanted to pursue a career in hot rods and uh, classic cars. So I went to a, an automotive tech school, got a job with a restoration shop, worked there for a, about a year. Really, really enjoyed what I was doing, but not so much the the job or the the specific location I was at. He wasn't happy. I uh, loved the comment that he said to me one day, Dad, this isn't anything like working for you or with you. So it was kind of a, a, a neat thing for me to hear. I was looking to make a change, turn more wrenches again. And uh, in that same time frame, Dad was looking for another technician. His dad called and said, I'm looking for a tech. Are you interested? And Louie gave it a thought. And he said, yeah, Dad, I think I am. And dad said, okay, be in my office by nine. I'll interview you. And Louis said, interview me. I called him one day and I said, would I have a technician's position available? Would you want to come and interview for it? And he said, interview? And I said, yes. I wanted to treat him just like every other coworker. Um, didn't want him to feel as though he was special because he was the boss's son or anything. Him and I sat down for a while and hammered some details out and kind of came to an agreement that, you know, it was time to come back. The second that that child of mine, that man of mine at that point, had a title, that was when he fell in love with this business and realized that he was a really, really important part of it. I had a full-time salesperson. That salesperson left, couldn't really find anybody. I said, Kevin, would you give me a give me a hand with this for a little while? Being at the dealership 40 hours a week and, and taking classes, in between that, I also was spending about, about a day a week in the sales office as as the salesman was transitioning out onto whatever he was onto next. I took him to a dealer meeting with me and I'm listening to him talk to other dealers about their inventory. He knew what their inventory was. And he was standing in a circle of Nautique dealers from all across the country and he was telling them about their inventory and how long they had it in stock. And Lou stopped and looked and he was like blown away and he pulled him aside and he was like, Kevin, and you're kind of interested in this, you're kind of good at this. You, you want a shot at sales. Later in the day, I'm telling my dad about that interaction and he kind of looks at me and he says, well, Kev, you want to give this a try? Like I, I can stop interviewing people if you want to give it a try. I'm like, well, sure, why not? I don't know, I'm at that point, I'm 19 years old and, and just kind of taking everything day by day and didn't really have a, a direction for things. And so he started selling boats for us. I just really, really enjoyed working with the people, especially because what we sell is such a lifestyle-based product that it's just, it's all fun. It's all fun. It's it, I'm working with people that are investing in their idea of free time, their idea of fun. What more can you ask for? Just an amazing thing to watch, but it had to be their idea all the way through. They had to want to be here. I never wanted them to dread having to work in the family business. It never really was the plan for them to be full-time employees and even owners. One year, um, we had our family meeting, and uh, as we do every year, uh, we get together, the four of us, uh, right around Christmas time, we sit down, we talk about what happened in the previous year, what we, we plan on doing in the, the upcoming year. We talk about business. This particular year, I, uh, I was turning 30 years old, and I wanted to own a piece of this business before I turned 30. And Louis asked for ownership. And I think that probably was a, uh, a very proud moment for their dad. And sh sure enough, we were able to all sit down and, and hammer some details out and, and make it happen before, before my 30th birthday. And then I put a succession plan together that worked not only for them, but for my wife and I. One of the things I wanted to make sure was that my relationship with my boys didn't change. And more importantly, that the relationship between Kevin and Louie didn't change. One running service and one running sales and not competing against each other as brothers. Now, you have to know that sales and service do this, but the boys don't. They understand the load that the others carry. They respect it and they they usually jump in and help the other. They totally understand that they are every bit a co-worker as they are owners. We work together first, and when it comes to being ownership, that's when we make those bigger decisions, you know, in, you know, off to the side or at our family meetings. They've earned their 
ownership. They they were owners long before they asked for a piece. I've been invested in this place since since the very beginning. Um, I was very passionate about my job anyway. It is nice to, you know, to be able to sign my name to it, um, to be able to put my name on this place and be, be I'm absolutely proud of it. In the last three years, um, we've more than tripled what we, what we were doing. Um, and that all is, has to do with us working as a team, but certainly with the boys being part of the dealership. In order to have them be a good part of the business and want to make a, a good living at it, we needed to expand again. We were looking Gosh, for probably three years, we looked at different properties. We looked at marinas on different lakes in our area. Um, in our yearly family meeting, we had a big discussion about moving the dealership and what would that mean. And what we realized was after all of these years of operating out of this facility, we built the business in a 25 mile radius. And so if we moved it 20 or 30 miles in any direction, it would kind of hinder us. So we decided, no, this is the area we need to stay. We've established ourselves here. How do we expand? The more we talked about it, the more the, more the ideas sprung, the more we realized we need more than just one roof. And fortunately, there were 16 acres directly across the street. We were able to purchase that property. It was two building lots. And we started engineering and putting building plans together. As we've really kind of taken the plans of this new dealership from just ideas to blueprints to, to actually starting construction and, and making the move, it's been really cool to see all the ideas come to life. The biggest thing about moving to this new facility from across the street was that we were inadequate. Our facility was costing us money. And so when you're able to say, I can't afford not to do something, that money spends pretty easily. I never wanted to plan on increasing the business to pay for a facility like this. What I wanted to do was figure out where our inadequacies were, assign dollars to those inadequacies, and be able to pay for this place just by being more efficient. Not by raising our prices or labor rates or anything like that, but just being more efficient. Expanding our business at the other place, I was always a step behind, so to speak, or, or not thinking big enough. We knew what we needed to move into, so we went larger than that, but we also made plans for future expansions. Where's the next building gonna go? How would we expand the existing building? Uh, storage buildings, where could they fit? And how much property do we need? Hence why we purchased the, the two building lots instead of just one. We have been here not even a year and we're already using the second building lot saying, wow, we need to be looking even bigger yet. There's been multiple improvements since moving over here. There has to have been, was it, what was it for if we, we couldn't? We built specific winterization bays. Winterization is a big part of our business. We had to streamline how we winterized boats. In the other facility, we had two winterization bays, and even those were enhanced from what they had been years before that. This facility has four. We built a new hoist that's uh, three times the size of the old hoist. The other facility, we were unloading tractor trailers on the edge of the highway. We'd need as many as four or five guys out there to unload a tractor trailer. The hoist that we design now, we can unload it in the facility. They back under the hoist, pick one boat up, slide it to the side, set it on a trailer. Essentially, one person could actually unload a tractor trailer in in short order. We've got one storage building on the site now. On our plan are two others. Being able to have, especially the, the storage boats that require winter work, being able to have them here at this facility has been huge as well. Already we're seeing through this winter how much easier it is to be able to be productive throughout the you know, the off season. Our service manager, we put him, his office is in the middle of the building. Just having an office period, it's it's been a game changer for me. The service writer is just outside his door. The parts manager is just outside his door. I'm right across the, the hall from my parts guy uh, with when he ever, he needs questions answered. And then I, right outside the door is also my service advisor. We even put sliding glass doors 
from his office to this service shop. Having the sliding glass door right off the shop, my texts can easily get to me to ask me any questions. Not only could he have more visibility, but it was easier to get in and out. And, and if he needs to talk to a technician, he was able to close the sliding glass door, have a conversation and not be interrupted. It's nice to have my own space. Probably one of the biggest things we did was we put in a test pond. We've always been at a little bit of a drawback being a blacktop location. It's been kind of hard to achieve putting boats on the water and testing different things. Every time we had to back a boat in the water or do anything, we'd have to take it 45 minutes to an hour away to actually be able to run it. It's such a huge time saver for us and it's been paying for itself since we were able to float that first boat in there. It's a little over a third of an acre, but we designed it so that we could do a figure eight in it so we could get the boat actually up on plane and run it, check cruise controls and these kinds of things. As much as just floating a, floating a boat in there to be able to check for leaks for in the running gear or if we install a, install a stern thruster or underwater lights or something along those lines and just need to float float the boat to make sure that our repair was good that our install was good and that there is no leaks that the customer won't have any issues um prior to having the pond it was a 45 minute towing the boat to lake apakong and then coming back now it's right in our backyard just back the boat down the ramp tie it up at the seawall and come check it in the morning it's just big enough to be able to test the surf systems on these wake boats, uh, to be able to set the cruise control at 11 miles an hour and watch watch the plates deploy and the wave form. And it's been, it's been incredible. The designs of the boat and the coloring that I've chosen don't always translate on the trailer. The graphic designers at these boat companies designed how the boat were to look floating in the water. And that's something I've always strived for and didn't, didn't really know how I would achieve was being able to photograph all of our boats here for sale floating in the water. Now, though, having this test pond, that's something that we've been able to do. We've been able to set an appointment with a customer and float a boat parked at the dock and they can see multiple boats in the water in the same day, kind of get a feel for how high it sits off the water. And it's, it's also just, again, part of that experience of they just spent however long in the car driving away from their lake house to come here to the dealership and, oh, the boat I came to see is floating in the water. So it's, it's kind of a, a neat little opportunity, but it's become a huge tool for us in now being able to really spotlight how these boats look on the water and taking photos for our website with the boats floating. We didn't want our customers feeling that because we weren't on the water that they were at a disadvantage. So by having this test pond here, we don't have to you know, take every boat to the lake anymore. That's what's paying for the expansion, not our customers. We sell the best products on the market and there is such an expectation for the white glove service, which is something we strive for. But along those lines, I finally feel like we have a facility, we have a dealership experience that matches the level of the product. So in the idea of now building a full-sized showroom and being able to hold more than one boat, but now we've got five to six on, on average here inside, what's been really important to me is to make sure that every single customer comes to the dealership and gets the same experience. So rather than, yeah, I, I Remember, I came on that day in February and it was snowing and, and we, we kind of got to look through the boat a little bit, but we didn't see it very well. For me, I identified pretty quick that that was a lost opportunity because here's your young son and daughter maybe outside in a coat, freezing cold, daddy, can we go inside? Well, now you just kind of lost the whole aspect of the family being engaged and want to ask the questions about what you're taking a look at. So now to have the facility to be able to accommodate bringing a boat inside and having it set up maybe here in our showroom or in our state-of-the-art service department, it just contributes to that memorable experience we're trying to give of the day you came to the dealership to see the boat. You want to have happy customers, but in order to have happy customers and have them come back and be become loyal customers, you need to create memorable experiences. Well, who creates those memorable experiences? but your staff. We explained to our staff that every single time you talk with a customer is an opportunity to create that memorable experience. How do we create something that's not just cookie cutter, that's personalized, that makes someone want to do business with you? I think the biggest thing about it is just being genuine. You know, it's not something scripted that I, that I have the people do here. It's just being a good listener paying attention to the customer's needs, paying attention to what their problems are, and working with them and for them to fix those problems. If you can do those things, it actually is a pretty easy way to create a 
memorable experience. For us, it's just important that every customer is taken care of exactly the same, whether it be they're buying a $50,000 boat or a $500,000 boat, chances are whatever they're buying that purchase at $50,000 is just as significant to them as it is the person spending $500,000 at whatever financial status. When you're hitting the mark with your customer every single time, you've set their expectation. So even though you're doing a better job than most of the dealers out there, your customers have come to expect this level of service. So when we do something wrong, I actually look at it as a golden opportunity to not only make us better, but to gain more loyalty. I've watched Lou say, no, we've got it. Like if we did something wrong, yeah, but what's it gonna cost me? It's not gonna cost you anything. If we did something wrong, we're gonna take care of it. Yes, but they don't know not to fight because they've had to fight so many times. And once you win a customer over, some of our worst experience have created some of the most loyal customers. I live by a seven to one rule, make seven people happy, get one referral, upset one person, they tell seven people. But if the narrative on the, the seven people they're telling because they had a bad experience ends up, yes, but this is what they did wrong, but this is what they did to fix it, you can even take a bad experience and turn it into a positive one. We don't have a checklist to check the boxes. Did we say this to the customer? Did we do this for the customer? No, this is our culture to be helpful, to give the boat back in better condition than what it came in. When we're delivering a new boat, you know, make that experience be just something that the customer has never experienced before. So many people in working their eight to five jobs and, and really in our industry, for somebody who afford these boats, it's rarely is it only eight to five. So their free time is very valuable. And the gift of being able to spend that with your family on the water is just, it just equals priceless memories. Having a good and happy staff is probably the, the most important thing. If you ask the average business owner what the most important thing in their business is, they're probably gonna tell you the customer, and it's, it's not, at least for me, it's, it's absolutely the coworker. And I use the word coworker, I don't use the word employee. Um, I work with these people, we work together, and um, I genuinely care about the people that work here. I've said this at staff meetings, it's not all about money. And when you can say that, it takes a lot of pressure, not only off of me, but off of the people that I work with. If they know that they're allowed to do something wrong, that they're not gonna get screamed at, that it's not gonna cost them anything, it makes them feel as more part of something special, something better than just the average job out there. People here make mistakes all the time. What we try to do from those is I don't dwell on what it cost me. To an extent, I look at it as being part of doing business. So I just pay, write the check, whatever I need to do to make it right. I make sure the customer knows that, that it happened and this is what we're doing to make it right. And I tell my people, it's pretty simple if you do something wrong. There's three things about doing something wrong. One is you admit it. Number two, you wholeheartedly apologize for it. Number three is you do whatever it takes to make it right. If we do that with our customers, and if you people here do it with me, we can't, we can't fail. And so that has been, a, I believe, a, a huge contributing factor to the success of our business. Over the years, um, as we've grown and so forth, our dealership has been able to win some awards. And I look at every award as, as a great achievement. We belong to a couple of organizations. One is the MRAA, Marine Retailers Association of the Americas. They have a couple of programs. One is uh, employee satisfaction. And so there's a 40 question survey that every one of our employees takes. It's done anonymously. And then uh, there's 360 some dealers across the country that are certified. So they'll take that information and they will rank us against the national average. They'll take all those dealers, they'll compile the information and then they'll, they'll score us and we'll see where we rank in the nation. What they'll do is they'll take the top dealers. If you get a 90% score or higher, they consider you one of the best dealerships to work for. And we've achieved that a number of times. We've been rated as high as number four in the nation. To place that high with that award nationally, it tells us that they, they feel the commitment that we have to them and they understand that this 
we've created a culture um, and the culture is working, that, that they're each looking out for each other. They know they're in a safe place here and that their time here really matters. And for me, that's probably the, the biggest payback. Hey, Sherry, did you ever hear back from the MRA? I have. We've been chosen as one of the great dealerships to work for. Lou, 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 we made it. We're one of the greatest dealerships to work for. That's great, Chris. I'm so excited. This is wonderful. We made it, we made it, we made it. We were selected as one of the greatest places to work for. Woohoo! Louie, Louie, we made it. What? We made it? Yeah. We made, we made it. it. Yeah! yeah! John, we made it. We made it! No way! So it looks like the approval came back at 45%. Kevin, we made it! We made it! We made it! Matt, we made it! What? We made it! Chris! No! No! We made it! We made it! We made it! That was great! <laughs> I hope you got it! <laughs> Offshore is a great place to work! Yeah. We've won a number of service awards and those are all generated by customers. The 100% customer satisfaction is a really, really big deal. We won Dealer of the Year for customer satisfaction. We had 100% of surveys returned with a 100% score from Nautique. That was, that was a pretty big deal. But the same year, we won PCM's Servicing Dealer of the Year Award, which directly is reflected on me and, and my guys and, and the, the job that we're doing out in the shop. That was a pretty big deal. Boating Industry Magazine, they have a program called Top 100. Being a Top 100 dealer has been something we've, we've worked pretty hard on. And if you do it right, it's a pretty grueling process. And when I say do it right, it means don't rerun last year's application. It means look at every question new um, because the more time you put in it, the better you become as a dealer. For ourselves to have that level of gratification knowing that we ranked within the top 100 of all of those other dealers, it just really just kind of drove our perspective and our, our ambitions forward because we've been honored as one of the best. Let's, we can, we can be better. It's a way of self-evaluation. It's a way of uh, measuring yourself against the industry and seeing where you're lacking, what you can do better. The great thing is we've been a certified dealer for many, many years. We've been a top 100 dealer for many years. Once we achieve that, we go back and look at where we scored or where we're deficient and we say, okay, how can we do it better next year? The whole process over the years has definitely made us a better dealer. It, it has definitely put us to a standard that we wouldn't have been at without the process, that grueling process. Winning the awards is great, but going through the process, which is painful, has absolutely made us a better dealership. There is a difference for the, the consumer you, working with a dealer that's been rated as a top 100 thing. It's not just a, a one page form that you apply for and say, great, here's, here's your sticker. You're a consumer best dealer. No, we are truly ranked within the top 100. I think there's a number of reasons why people are being driven to offshore marine from such a wide area. We do service customers as far as 125 miles away, so that's a pretty large radius, but we work hard at making that feel like we're in their backyard. Our reputation goes a really, really long way, and service is the most important thing when it comes to this industry and, and really our, our business. With us, when you schedule a service call, we're going and showing up directly to your dock where you don't even need to drive it to the local dealership, trying to provide that higher level of service uh, that nobody else is providing. I always say to customers that, that your purchase of a boat is not the end of our relationship, it's only the start. The reason why you want people to hopefully buy locally is to support small business and to build a community. We know that small business um, supports more jobs in this country than any other large business. Small business gives a lot of young people their first opportunities at working. I think we've had 25 or 26 young people have their first jobs be at Offshore Marine. We certainly have given a lot of first-time jobs to high school kids and we have taken
you know, make model location. He can tell you different in intricacies about the way that the dock is set up. Or I don't know that you you get that kind of service from one of the bigger um, conglomerate dealerships. We sympathize with the fact that the summers in this area are short. There's only there's only 12 weekends, maybe less, to a lot of people's boating experiences. So any time lost on the water is is really significant, and that's something we're super conscious of and and want to make the most of. To purchase a boat elsewhere, you're not necessarily our customer. You so to buy a boat from us, what you get is me. You get us, and we strive for that white glove service to make sure every minute on the water is is memorable, enjoyable, without hiccup. We contribute back to the community as well. We're able to do that because our customers are loyal to us and they buy locally. When I learned about the a local organization that offered like seasonal fundraisers, we participated in, in all of those. We've donated to every baseball, football, basketball, soccer, wrestling, you know, uh, organization there is and churches and fire departments and so forth. One of the largest ones is a Project Self-Sufficiency, which is a local organization that helps families in need and we have participated in a lot to help that organization help the community. Stuff the Boat was a way that we really could make an impact on our community. The fun part of that was the idea started with a rowboat and Lou looked at me and said no think bigger and, I, and that, was for, that first year we tried it I didn't even know if we were going to fill the rowboat right but yeah we went with a 20 footer and, and sure enough we were like three quarters of the way full the first year. We enlisted some of the volunteers that Lou works with to make it bigger and better. And every year we've just completed our best yet. Our dealership's done very well selling the best brands on the market. But as the boating industry is becoming harder and harder to obtain into the newer status because the, the boats are getting so expensive, we are doing very well with the idea of these luxury brands, these high quality brands in a pre-owned setting. Very, very often, especially for first-time boat buyers that I work with that are kind of iffy on what the right fit is and, and size and model and, and what they're looking to achieve on the water, for me, very often I'll point to say, let's look at something pre-owned and the idea that this boat's already decreased in value a little bit. It's giving you the opportunity to buy it and have it be a much lower investment in the idea that from two to three years from now, you decide, you know what, this wasn't the right fit. We're ready to get into something different or Owning a boat wasn't what we thought, or, or in the dream scenario for all of us to say, we fell in love with this, we really want to go a little bit bigger next time around, we do want to have a better surf wave or a faster boat, and, and now we can once again talk about the next step in a pre-owned boat, or now maybe we are talking about a new one. So we offer a pretty unique array of products where one of the few locally, as a matter of fact, when we go dealer to dealer across the nation, we have a bigger selection, believe it or not, than most of the uh, the dealers that we visit. Having our ship store is really important because we've got all the essentials to safely go boating, all the equipment you need for a safe day on the lake. And that becomes a nice complement to having our pro shop with some of the state-of-the-art equipment that we do, being able to outfit somebody into a new surfboard. And that's one thing we often find is that every boat surfs differently, so every surfboard feels different behind every boat. So having the latest and greatest of the brands that we do is is important. We feel as though this is part of part of the whole experience that we want to offer. And we try to have things that are a little bit different or a little bit better quality than what you can get Amazon or Walmart. While you can see a variety of products out on the floor, there are two stories worth of parts rooms for items that are not really worthy of being displayed. So if you need it, we good chance we have it. Being able to offer and accommodate really just about anybody that's looking to achieve anything on the water, something we work pretty hard at. 38 years of working side by side with my wife has just been incredible. She's the best person I know. Um, she is um, She is why I am who I am today. And so be, having the opportunity to be able to work with her side by side has been huge. We didn't talk about the man upstairs. We didn't talk about the big boss. Something that I learned a long time ago is that don't ever tell that man you can't. And so whenever growth created an obstacle, whenever someone said, oh, that you can't do that, whenever things got hard, 
he just worked harder. He just figured out a way that you can't do that became watch me. I want people to look at us as not just a business in town, but um, a family who cares about what happens in this town and our community. I hope people are happy that we're in their town, that they're proud of the business that we've uh, established and um, that we're part of the community. Retirement for me, there is no such thing as retirement now. Where I'm going is to kind of cut back some. I'm 62 years old and, and so I'm looking at what retirement will be and it will always include work, but my wife will be the first one to tell you that I need it. Through that transition, through our family meetings, we've talked about Kevin starting to take more of my responsibilities. So as sales manager, he will be able to take some of my responsibilities as I start to back off some. Uh, eventually, he will be general manager. You know, after working 75, 80 hours a week and, and push, 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 and I was fortunate to have the energy to be able to do that. I don't regret any of it. Uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful ride, and I plan on continuing on for many years, but again, at a lesser capacity, because um, I do have some hobbies I really enjoy. So, um, and I love spending time with my wife. So um, we've got some things planned.